And so that might be our goal. Most soils right now, if you go out here and test a foot deep and take a representative sample going down to a feet, less than 1%. And so for every percentage point of carbon or organic matter that we add to the soil, and not just on the surface, but integrated into the top two or three inches, it vastly increases the amount of water that will soak into that soil. And getting water into the ground is one of the best ways to sequester CO2 into the soil, because you've got living plants that die and leave their biomass in the soil. And trees cyclically, year after year, in the spring and fall, will put out feeder roots, and then those feeder roots die back in the summer and winter, and those are making organic matter in the soil. You ever seen where they tear down an old fence line that's had a bunch of trees growing on it, and it's a big built-up burn, or the sidewalk by where a big live oak tree is, and the roots on that live oak tree are busting up the sidewalk? Well, that's what's going on all the time, but... The more water we add to the environment, the more carbon, the more plant growth we're going to get, and the more carbon that we're going to sequester into the soil. So, 5% organic matter is our goal. Let's talk a little bit about the Explorers Texas and what's been going on since 1865. So the Europeans came in, a lot of Germans at first, the Spanish, of course, and we basically cut down all the primary forests. We got rid of the bison to a large extent. Uh, who can we give a little bit of credit to for saving the bison? Molly Goodnight, Charles Goodnight's wife. And so Charles Goodnight was a Texas ranger. They had a ranch up near Caprock Escarpment. There's a famous geological formation there called the Lighthouse. Uh, I went to Reese Air Force Base. I was in the Air Force too. And there's a state park around the lighthouse. Reese Air Force Base has since closed down and famously poisoned its groundwater through all the solvents they were using to decrease the machine parts. But Molly Goodnight stored a herd of about 400 bison back up in this canyon. And after Buffalo, there's a town in Texas called Buffalo Gap. And that's where the big hunting parties would leave. They would supply up and they basically were killing the bison to hurt the Native Americans and get the pelts. And, and then later on, the bison notoriously carried brucellosis, which is hoof and mouth disease. And so now the ranchers who are growing cattle, they don't want the bison anywhere near the cattle. And buffalo is, you know, I like the term buffalo. It's technically a misnomer. Uh, the bison are slightly different than buffalo, so I adhere to the term bison, but I think I prefer the word buffalo. So Alan Savory says that without the bison eating the plant matter and then pooping and peeing everywhere, organic matter has a very hard time breaking down in certain dry environments. And he calls this dry environment brittle. This is Savory, mind you, not uh, Del Winninger. Del Winninger is mostly a historical account. And Alan Savory says that the brittleness line starts about Kerrville. So west of Kerrville, you basically can't break plant matter down into organic matter without the ungulates, which are hooved animals with the ruminant gut. And so west of Kerrville, if you took a slab of concrete and put it underneath the tree, 20 years later, there'd just be dust blowing across that slab of concrete. Whereas if you go down into the tropics of Central America, you put a piece of concrete out under a tree, 20 years later, you're gonna have three or four inches of organic soil on top of that concrete. And Savory calls these ecosystems that are losing all their topsoil and all their diversity, he calls them leaky ecosystems. And so without intervention of human beings, these ecosystems will continue to leak topsoil, biomass, and diversity. And so at some point, us humans, we have to rise up to the occasion. And in Texas, really, there are no climax ecosystems. A climax ecosystem is a static ecosystem that's kind of reached its zenith. Uh, they speculate that the clim climax ecosystems might be in the bottomlands of East Texas, where there's a lot of beech and birch and maple. And diversity doesn't always necessarily exist in these climax ecosystems, not the highest levels of diversity like the estuaries are where all the diversity is, and they're constantly being disturbed. 
So the next step down from climax ecosystems is subclimax ecosystems, and those are periodically being disturbed by bison, by uh, wind throw, by ice storms. The passenger pigeons used to fly overhead. It would take them two to four weeks for the entire flock to fly overhead. And underneath where they flew all their guano or bird manure, it would disturb the ecosystems that they flew over. It would scald and kill the plant matter. And then that would give rise to another wave of natural succession. And so I like to say, we have to become disturbance. We have to figure out how to do this wisely and measure the cost benefit of the energy we expend versus the carbon we sequester. And really carbon sequestration and sustainability, it's an energy equation. Like how much, what's the yield of what we spend? And so Laura, where did Laura go? She was, um, there she is. She was interested in knowing about the juniper. And so what happens underneath the juniper tree and again, the city of Austin told us 20, 30 years ago, this tree was not native. Texas A&M University put out a publication called the Juniper Symposium. It described junipers as water hogs. And uh, all that has since been debunked. The juniper tree is native. <coughs> like I said, there's the juniper virginialis that grows further east where there's more water. And then there's the juniper ashii, which grows further west. And it's more shrubby. So our juniper virginialis out where I live, it looks like a freaking Christmas tree. It's, a, it's an attractive tree. And when the Spanish saw it, they were very impressed. So what happens underneath this tree is it forms, the Arabic word for it is called nebka. And it's a needle mat. And these needles are sticky and they stick together even on steep slopes. And so I've done quite a bit of ecological restoration with the Edwards Aquifer Authority, the city of Austin, and the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. And like I said, if you're gonna spend 10,000 or $100,000 doing ecological restoration, this is your competitor, the juniper. Because if you just left it alone, it would completely cover the mountainside with nebka. And if you stick your hand at that nebka, some nebkas are like 12 to 15 inches thick in its black, light, organic matter underneath those trees. Now that's not a very useful environment for livestock and human beings. Of course, that's what's driven the decline of the Texas Hill Country, is our need for cedar shingles or cypress shingles and charcoal and construction lumber. So back to understanding what ecosystems are supposed to be here. So Texas prairies, Prairie is a French word. And when we say prairie, what we our mind jumps to a grassland ecosystem. Well, grassland ecosystems really only naturally occur in semi-arid and arid landscapes. And so that's west of Kirkville. So if, if you want a 100% grassland ecosystem, that's you imposing your will on that landscape, you know, which I understand. Our neighbors have cut down almost every tree on their property and they make hay and they export the biomass off their property selling hay to our neighbors. And, but a prairie is about 50-50 woodland grassland. And like I was saying, the closer you get to the coast, maybe that's 60% tree cover, 40% grass, until you get out into West Texas where now you're into a savanna and eventually into a grassland. So if you've inherited a piece of property like Laura was talking about, and poor land management has occurred there for the last 150 or 200 years, your property might be almost completely covered in cedar, maybe live oak, there's probably some live oak out there, which is a very tenacious tree, that took a big hit back in the early mid 70s when the uh, oak wilt erupted. But that has pretty much passed through this ecoregion. Uh, you might choose a ratio to maintain. So, you know, good design is a process of elimination. Does anybody remember Donald Rumsfeld back in the day after 9-11? You got your known knowns and your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns. Well, your, un your known knowns are your slopes. So if you've got a steep creek embankment or you've got a, a steep hilltop or ridge, let the cedars have that. So there's your known known. 
And once you've given those steep slopes over to the junipers and the live oaks and other tree cover, that might be the area that you begin to maintain open. Because humans were just like deer. It's like we want to have the woods to our back and then an open vista out in front of us. Like if you've got a, a pond and your cattle come to water at night, it's nice to sit on your porch and see the edge of that pond and do a head count of your cows. Or if you've got a view that might let you see your front gate, but you don't want the headlights shining into your house, but strategic lines of sight. So that's kind of how you start. And then back to the agrarian platform access. So you're like literally where I live, I have to mow my roads because they're just gravel roads. And if you don't drive on them, they'll just turn into grass and brush. And what's the first thing that comes up in a neglected area? Well, it's your weeds. It's like the ragweed and the sunflower and the dove weed. And, and then you get like your in, invasive, invasive things can be native. Really what we mean by invasive is opportunic, opportunistic. So we get the neglect baccarus, poverty weed, Roosevelt weed. That's another name for it. Hackberry, Greenbrier, Mesquite, Juniper. So if you do nothing, that's what you'll get. And it takes about 50 years for it to mature and then thin where you can actually walk through it. So you can go that route. It's a long, patient route. Or you can do a little bit of disturbance and uh, mow or graze. So now um, we've got a friend of mine. He brings anywhere from 9 to 15 head of cattle onto the property once a year. And it takes them about four weeks to graze our 32 acres. And that's what Alan Savory was really uh, famous for, was intensive cell grazing. And I didn't bring that up right away because I wanted the focus to be on his current endeavor, which is Holistic Management International. So intensive cell grazing, mowing. Now, Del Winter, the one thing there was no evidence of in Texas before 1865, prescribed fire. So Europeans introduced fire to the Native Americans and started burning in Texas. It was a different environment. It was more humid. The bison were disturbing things. Like their fire occurred according to the records of Alan Savory, I mean, uh, Del Winter looked into every 100 to 300 years, sir. So I, I think maybe also for everyone here, part of the reason that this is so important, like what it was, is, and is what you just hit on. It didn't use to catch on fire when it was a uh, completely integrated vegetative system that was rich in biomass, rich in carbon, rich in moisture retention. And so that's why he's talking about this over here. Like, try to visualize what it was like before we developed it and eroded it and you know, came into a world that we thought had always been like this. It actually was much more rich. The cedars that he's talking about, they, they were like redwoods. Yeah, they were probably four to six feet in diameter and a couple hundred feet tall. And It's a history we don't really know. Our history of Texas that the universities carry in their libraries really starts about 1890. And it's referred to as the golden era of the Southwestern stockmen. And so the bison are gone, the Native Americans are gone. We just passed the Wild Burroughs and Horses Act and sent them all to Galveston and Fort Worth to be slaughtered. And then here come all these German settlers and that's where we get the term, it was a sea of grass. And yeah, there was probably a lot nicer grass and a lot more topsoil, but that's where that all stems from. So, fire is a tool, and neither Bill Mollison nor Alan Savory were big fans of prescribed fire. But if you talk, you go to the Wildflower Research Center, or you talk to somebody from the United States Natural Resource Conservation Service, that's their number one management tool. But what are they really after? Woody brush control. So it's really all about woody brush control, and it's about maintaining these ratios. And so when we talk about agriculturally productive ecosystems, uh, Mark Shepard, who did, a, he did another great workshop. He, he's from Wisconsin. He talks about how a savanna or a prairie ecosystem is really a perfect ecosystem to copy. So as rough as we have it here on this hyper arid desert belt, prairies and uh, savannas are really good ecosystems to copy because it's basically like this, where you've got sporadic trees with grass growing in between them. And so you increase the amount of plant leaf surface area that photosynthesis can occur on. Uh, and then the, the true prairie, we're looking at a prairie, let's say this is a map. 
So this is what we call a plan view. This is a top-down look at what a prairie is. So your creeks, let's say this is a draw, that would be wooded. So that's your waterway. These are your trees. And then your hilltop would have a cluster of trees on it there. And he called these mots. Another French word, Calvinian. So a prairie is a mosaic of grass and woods. And you get these little islands called mots. And you could have a mot of live oak, all one species of tree. You could have a mot of the uh, wild plum, the Chickasaw plum that we have. Of course, if you stick a Chickasaw plum in the ground, it suckers. So it's like, it could just take over your whole property. We have a Chickasaw plum mot on the other side of our farm, uh, county road, and it's about an acre. 200 by 200 is an acre. And I've seen them up to like an acre and a half or three acres, but that was what a prairie is. Again, lots of room for sunlight and grass and about 40 to 60 percent tree cover. Okay. Let's do a little site assessment. So we're, we're coming in. So we started with design systems, ecological awareness, the Explorers Texas, and now we're going to do a little site assessment in carbon accounting. I'm going to start with just a generic city lot because I don't know the layout of this property really well. It'd be a great thing to do on Google Earth Pro. So typically, this is your typical, it's your driveway and your sidewalk. And here's the house. And let's just keep it simple when north is here and south and west and east. So we want to be mindful in the winter. You want the sun to come into the house. And the winter time is doing this. So in the summertime, the sun is overhead at noon. In the wintertime, the sun is about 60 degrees at noon, shining into the house. It's low in the sky, so it tracks low like this. So what we want to do, if we audit our house for its energy efficiency, is we probably want to have deciduous tree cover on the west side. And this site has a lot of trees on it. I've noticed that in older neighborhoods in the urban environment, there's a lot of good tree cover. I grew up in Houston and my friend lived close to the Galleria, which is off of the 610 loop. And I was in a high rise building. I forget what I was doing. My mom was probably working up there. And I looked out over my buddy's neighborhood and it was almost 100% tree cover. But when you're on the street, it didn't feel like that at all. But so we want tree cover, and deciduous means that it loses its leaves in the winter. So it's going to shade a building in the summertime and let the sun through it in the winter. Now, a lot of my friends are in solar photovoltaic installation, and they always tell me before you go crazy installing solar panels, do an energy audit of your home. So do you have adequate shade? I would say you also want to shade your sidewalks. So you want to have some trees that shade your sidewalks because that concrete will give off a lot of heat. Do you have decent windows in your house? Do you have decent insulation in the, the roof or attic of your home? And before you invest in an expensive photovoltaic solar panel system, you probably need to address the energy that you're spending to heat and cool your house. And that goes back to that first principle of permaculture design, the biggest bang for your buck. Now, solar panels, I find to be, there are a lot of them, but the panels have gotten very efficient. There's a company called SunPower, and their panels now are 304 watt hours. So you get 10 of those, and that's 3,000 whatever watt hours or Kilo, or three kilowatt hours. Uh, so it's gotten very, I'm not a big fan of the battery technology. I would rather just do a grid tie system. And if you wanted electricity backup at your site, I'd recommend an on-demand propane generator that kicks on when the power goes off after a certain period of time. Uh, have you been hearing about the Tesla cars catching on fire? And if you park a Tesla car in your garage, you have to notify your homeowner's insurance. And it's the same with the Tesla battery wall packs. Like if these things go off, your whole house could burn down. 
And they're, so I just don't like the battery technology. I'd rather just give the power to the grid and for emergency backup, I'd rather rely on storable liquid fuels and the good old reliable internal combustion engine. So solar panels is one way to balance your carbon deficit on your site. The other way, which really ties in better to gardening, is rainwater collection. I've been on rainwater now for 30 years. It's our only source of water. Now we've had to, we've had to get water from our neighbors, but I'd like to think in my house, we've eliminated the possibility of waste when it comes to water. Now I grew up with my mother, like turn, or my grandmother really, who grew up during the Depression era. You know, turn the water off when you're brushing your teeth and turn the lights out when you leave the room. And I like to think that if you collect every drop of water off your roof, and then all that water when it leaves the house is going into the landscape, you can run out of water, but you've basically eliminated the possibility of waste. And these landscapes need water. We kind of need to get over the austerity mindset that we've grown up with, like this, I call it eco guilt. But good design absolves you of eco guilt. But you got, you know, so I, before you step up and spend $20,000 on solar panels, I'd rather spend $5,000 on a rainwater collection system. Yes? This may be a silly question, but part of my hesitancy to do rainwater is because my house. The roof has shingles. Is it no difference between a metal roof and composite shingles? Okay. De this debate was going on 15 years ago. Just look up some of the studies that have been done. So composite shingles are the asphalt shingles with a little bitumen sprinkled on top of it. It's a petroleum product. Uh, it's all the same stuff that's coming off of it. But you know, if you were concerned about it, you could just use the water in the landscape. City of Austin doesn't want you to drink rainwater. They'd rather chlorinate and fluoridate your water because that makes them feel better. I don't know if it's any better for us, but I've been drinking unfiltered rainwater for 30 years. Just look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I have a healthy gut flora. I'm like, is that dead squirrel I taste? Uh, <laughs> has happened before. Uh -huh. Now, I find it very interesting over the whole course of my career since whenever I've been doing this, 1990 or so, we find a lot of reasons to not collect rainwater. And here I am, we're working our hearts out with Edwards Aquifer Authority and the Wimberley Watershed Valley Association, and we're just scratching away at the surface. Meanwhile, you know, 3,000 wells a year are going down in the aquifer. You know what the city allocates for one person's consumption per day in the city of Austin? 150 gallons per day. That's how they account. So, you know, whatever our population is, multiply that times 150 gallons a day. And that's what the city is trying to provide in its extended jurisdiction. Yeah, but what's this rain you keep talking about? I know, well, okay. So, let's just say you have a thousand square foot roof for simplicity's sake. Now, here in Austin, we get somewhere between 32 inches, 36 inches per annum. We used to. We used to. And for simplicity's sake, we'll just say that's three feet. And then we'll go back and talk about what's going on. We've had two of the worst years of drought this past summer and the summer before that. And then before that, between 2008 and 2011. When I was growing up, we were talking about deforestation and desertification and the albedo effect and all this stuff. Now everything just hinges on CO2, which I find like disheartening because we're not talking about deforestation and desertification anymore. We're talking about pulling the plug on natural gas, which I think is a huge mistake. So anyway, so you got a thousand square foot surface. You might get three feet of rain a year. So that's 3,000 cubic feet of water. And we'll just start rounding down our amount. How many gallons in a cubic foot of water? 7.4. So let's just say seven. So now you got 21,000 gallons per year coming off this 1,000 square foot roof area. Well, you, you, you're gonna get that mostly in the spring and mostly in the fall. So you really only need to collect half of that. 
because it's going to rain in the spring. You're going to use that water. Your tanks are going to get low. And then it rains in the fall. They fill back up. So for every 1,000 square foot of roof surface area, you would be justified to have a 10,000 gallon system. And it's more valuable if you pressurize it. If you leave it just on gravity flow, you go to fill up a five gallon bu bucket, then you wake up in the middle of the night and remember you left that hose running to fill up a five gallon bucket. So, uh, Back in the day, Treehouse, well, all those green places, they sold these little on-demand pumps. Very low cost, but at least it's pressurized. You just have to drain these systems in the middle of winter. Because if they freeze, you'll bust a lot of pipes and you might ruin your pump. Uh, if you're gonna pressure, oh, the cisterns? Uh, a lot more work, but a lot of people do it. Now, then you're getting into really like septic tank technology where if you're not careful, that tank can pop out of the water. I've had two septic tanks pop up out of the ground after we installed them. It's like a submarine breaking up through the ice with all the pipes hanging off. the tank before you set it in the ground. Now the settlers in Texas, they built vase-shaped cisterns underground. They look, so let's say that's the rim sticking up above the ground and then underground they're like a pitcher. And you'll see these sticking out of the ground by old churches and stuff, and they're just maybe sticking up two or three feet tall. And they built them out of uh, lime plaster and brick. But then with the invention of leach fields and septic tanks, contaminated groundwater started getting into those tanks, into these cisterns, and they all got condemned. Same thing happened like in uh, the Caribbean. A lot of the European settlers there had rainwater collection systems underground. The tanks these days don't have that problem. Uh, but there's always that issue. So underground is just a little bit more work and uh, protecting your pipes and your pump is always an issue. Like my tank, I mean, my pump and pressure system is in a pump house that I built. It doesn't freeze anymore because I've been through that two or three times. And second or third time, you're like, that's it. That's <laughs> enough. You know, taking the, your pump, I think it was 2011 we had a hard freeze. Taking my Jay Gould pump, you know, into the shop, spending $200 to get it fixed. Did someone have their? Yes, yes ma'am. I saw one in Florida that was a rainwater collection system, like in an old church or something. Yeah. And it had a pipe that was like this big and it was above ground, but it was like a building. Oh, yeah. And then the water went in, and then what they had was a limestone thing like a limestone wall in there so that all of the water got filtered through the limestone oh interesting it was passing through and out yes through the well it, it was still all together no i mean it was a, but it all got filtered before anybody used it and they kept fish on that side little bitty fish on that oh, side oh interesting to eat any little insects so and stuff like anything, that anything anything that got and it was there's a little and ecosystem in it your was, system. It was open, but it was roofed. You know, There's so. an algal mat down there, and uh, I'm sure insects get in there. And you can filter it to your heart's content. Typically, you have a coarse filter, which is like a paper filter, and then you have a charcoal filter, which gets rid of odor and taste. And then if you really wanted to, under your sink, you could do reverse osmosis. So there's a company called Agritech, and they do the big installations you know, past 10,000. So I have a 5,000 gallon cistern and two 3,000 gallon cisterns. So I've got 11,000 gallons of storage and about 2,000 square feet of roof surface area. So I have barely a little over half of what I could have. Okay, so that's just carbon accounting. Like, so we've got, you know, we've got the site, we just have to identify the big, the elements that are generating the most CO2 and consuming the most energy in our landscape. Because like I said, with the Edwards Aquifer Authority, here we are up at the surface. We're digging swales and berms and conservation terraces. And meanwhile, you know, the city of San Antonio and the city of Houston and Austin, they're just sticking their straws down into the ground, depressurizing the water table. City of uh, Friendswood in Houston has subsided 40 feet. Mexico City has subsided 200 feet from depressurization of the groundwater table. So we're pumping all this in. They're living, you know, friends with, they're right there on the Gulf Coast with, you know, 42 inches of rainfall a year. 
And the engineers are just channeling that water off the landscape as quickly as they can. Or making these giant above ground uh, surface water reservoirs, which are a whole set of management issues in and of themselves. Okay. There was a good organization online, it's called greenamerica.org. And they define carbon farming, and it's basically agricultural practices that result in increased storage of atmospheric carbon in the soil. So that's the objective. That's our, for now, our holistic objective. Leftover biomass is returned to the soil as mulch. So sheet mulching is really important, although sometimes you have to break the pest cycles. So if any of you guys have ever been annual vegetable gardeners, there's the squash vine borer, and there's the harlequin beetle or the brassicas. And if those things are infected with eggs or larvae, you have to get rid of them. You have to get them off site and compost them. You know, off site could be 50 feet away with a lens of soil over them. So you can't just leave all your crop residue right there, but we do want to get it back onto the soil locally. Conventional tillage practices are replaced by no-till and mulch farming. So some of my favorite gardeners are uh, Ruth Stout, How to Have a Green Back Without an Aching Thumb. And she got tired of her neighbor. She got tired of waiting for the neighbor to come over with his tiller. So she just started sheet mulching with straw. Now I don't like sheet mulching with wood chips because wood chips aren't broken down enough. They actually soak up nitrogen and give off CO2 as they break down. Uh, so another... They're so big. The straw is very permeable. Yeah, and the straw creates a little tighter mat, but as it settles and compresses, it covers the surface of the soil quite well and doesn't need to be that thick. I mean, we're talking a half inch to two inches max. Another great gardener is Amelia Hazellip. She was inspired by Masanova Fukuoka. Her book was Synergistic Gardening, and it was basically raised beds and sheep mulching. Whereas Ruth Stout was just sheet mulching flat ground. And then if you really want to learn how to garden, and I always tell people, start conventionally and then wean yourself off of the practices that you don't like. So John Jevons, Square Foot Gardening, how to grow more food in less space than you thought possible. We used to jokingly say, how to do more work in less space than you thought possible. <laughs> but he double digs. Now, if you want carrots that are eight to 12 inches long, you need loose soil. So his whole modus operandi was this double dug garden, but you only really got to do it once and then you maintain the, the soil tilt like fluffiness with sheep mulching. Cover crops are one of my all time favorites. I learned about this in the Peace Corps and then picked it up later all over the place. So basically you've got cool season cover crops, which I prefer. So you're talking oat, rye, wheat, <coughs> barley, and then I love the Apiaceae family, which is the umbiliferous family. So cilantro and parsley make fantastic cover crops. What did you say with the A word? A Apiaceae. So that's the genus, or that's the family of all those. So that's the carrot family. So you got parsley. And these are really fun cover crops, cilantro. <laughs> And then the grass family is the Poaceae. So that's all your winter grains. That's your rye. Uh, now rye competes with native grasses. And uh, when we were doing some research for the uh, Edwards Aquifer Authority Field Research Park, uh, Texas Department of Transportation doesn't use ryegrass anymore because it competes with the emergence of spring native grasses. So that's when that ryegrass is really kicking. But if you want to create some biomass and get it in the ground, you can't beat ryegrass. And then, um, then you have your uh, brass KCA, which is your cold plants. So that's a uh, radish and turnip for cover crops. You can grow mustard too. Now our friends at Symbiosis Regenerative, they've gotten away from these plants because of the harlequin beetle. So if you leave and the daikon radishes in that category, if you get harlequin beetles infesting your brassicas or coal plants, oh, they're, they're those orange and yellow, they look like big ladybugs. And man, they are hard to get. You have to really deliberately disrupt that cycle. So back to 
What is carbon farming? Replacing monocultures with diverse crop rotations. Backing off of intensive use of chemical fertilizers. Integrating silvopasture and livestock. So you may have a big giant field where your big tractors are going back and forth all year long. Well, every 100 or three, you know, this is an old broader landscape, plant the row of trees. Maybe plant some of the leguminous trees, like there's some really great acacias and mesquite. You ever seen a mature mesquite? It's a beautiful tree. What we see typically is a mesquite bush that's exploding from a stump. And the, uh, the stem is about as big and thick as all the spines on it. So the bigger the mesquite tree gets, the smaller the needles or spines get. Get rid of surface flood irrigation. You want to create a desert, build a dam, till, and irrigate it with uh, trap dam water. I mean, that's basically what's happened in all of North Africa. Egypt used to be the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And so that's desertification. So using, because surface water impoundment has a lot of salts in it that run off from the land. And then the water evaporates out of the lake or the, the pond that's behind the dam. And then we irrigate with salty water and then we end up salt. I mean, the whole Middle East or North Africa, the, the agricultural soils have too much salt in them. Same with Australia. So switch over to drip irrigation and rely more on integrated pest management. This is something that A&M was working on you know, 30 years ago, like that's letting the ladybugs out to get rid of the aphids. And uh, some of it I really don't like that. A huge over-reliance on the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis. And so they're putting that into genetically modified corn now. Mm -hmm. So BT has been way overused, but it was at one point part of integrated pest management. Uh, last one, marginal and degraded soils are restored to their natural state. So again, if you've got a steep slope and it's eroded, stop farming it. I've watched farmlands near Manor and Elgin where they're tilling up and down slopes and you just watch the gullies farm. And then one year they just stop farming on that side of the gully and the next year it's a gully over there. And after a while, there's just barely any land left to, to till. Uh, time check, Chris. Uh, it's not that time. <laughs> is it 10 till? Is it 10 till 2? 143. Oh, I got seven minutes. <laughs> we'll spend the last 30 minutes outdoors, Chris. I see you putting on your sweater. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that greenamerica.org, that was a great website. Even mentions permaculture as ways to do, perform carbon farming. So some more specific permaculture techniques and we'll just go through them quickly. So on-site composting. Now, oddly enough, Bill Mollison and Massanova Food Folk didn't like composting. They said it was too much work. But you gotta think about the waste stream that we have in these cities of ours. Like, there is so much carbon mass from the tree trimmers, clearing for power lines, and. If you have a lawn, I got no, no bones with lawns. I like lawns, but if you're mowing a lawn or have a lawn care service, bag that material, store it in your backyard. Growing up in Houston, that's all we did. And we had the best compost that I've ever seen in my life. No turning, nothing, just after a couple of years. And we had those big pasture worms in there. I mean, they were like eight to 10 inch long earthworms in our compost. And then you put that back out on the soil. <laughs> And leaf clippings. So you need the carbonaceous leaf clippings. So they would just, they didn't rake the leaves. They just mowed the leaves and the grass clippings and all the fallen twigs and branches. And then they, it was about five foot wide, 20 foot long compost pile. And it was just like black hole. And anytime you cleared a little bit out, the earthworms are diving down. So in the Peace Corps, we do sticks and leaves, green matter, soil. Sticks and leaves, green matter, soil. And then we drive like a wooden branch down the middle to get air down in it. Yeah. And then we'd water it, but the soil was on top. And when the soil gets wet, it stays wetter longer and the weight of it causes it to compress. Now, if you're composting food scraps from your kitchen, I like those big drums that you turn because they've got screens on them, but they're very dry. And you have to add soil and water to them. Because if you have food scraps coming out of your kitchen, man, you'll get flies and maggots and rats instantly. And so the thing I like about those drums is that they basically have a screen on them. 
but you have to keep them wet. So I wouldn't be adding food scraps to that leaf and grass clipping compost pile. Those are two separate things. So if you're composting food scraps, you've got to definitely factor in flies, which can get in through almost anything but a screen, like a, a mosquito mesh. Uh, swales and berms. So this is basically topographical modification. Yes. You basically are building a raised bed on contour. So if this is your slope, Now this could be one shovel wide, this could be three shovels wide. And in the Peace Corps, we used to lay out a crop residue like corn. So we have corn stalks here and just one shovel wide, flip that over on the corn stalks and then water gets trapped here and you plant here, you know. Can you grow up straw, straw People uh, do like tomato cages to grow potatoes. So this is like wire mesh. And so they'll start the potatoes down here and they'll fill that up with straw. And then the potato plant, and they'll fill this whole thing up with straw. And the potatoes will make in that straw column. Now, you can... The cage, the tomato cage, you wrap it with? It's just like what they call remesh. It's like a six inch by six inch. Yes. So this would be like five foot tall. I've seen those. So what do you do with them? So you'd start your potatoes at ground level, and then every two to three months you add another about six or eight inches of straw, and that potato plant will just keep growing up through the straw. But it's making the root potatoes all throughout. But you're talking about somebody who's gardening in a round bed. I like all my stuff to be connected to the soil personally. I don't like hydroponics, all the like the zeitgeist movies they're gonna grow in uh, skyscrapers and just like you know, Plants wanna be connected to the soil. Okay, uh, so this is done on a level grade. So if the water's running off this way, you'd build, you do soil and water conservation perpendicular to the water runoff. We talked about uh, cover crops, and then farmer's trees, which are native nitrogen fixing trees like acacia and black locusts and mesquite. Uh, you plant those in rows on your property using perennial plants as well, like uh, fruit trees and asparagus and artichoke, blackberry, raspberry. So for every three fruit trees, which are cultivars, you might have one farmer's tree. And these are deep rooted, so they're bringing up minerals. They have light shade, so they're not shading out your annual vegetable garden. Uh, quite often they have sugary bean pods that are really good for livestock, may not be a criteria for us. A lot of farmer's trees, the leaves are edible by livestock, like the uh, golden ball lead tree and the guajillo, these are all native. And then uh, let me just add uh, soft rock minerals. Since so many of our soils are depleted, of organic matter and the minerals that they need. And again, back to trucking, like if I'm gonna truck in anything, I wanna truck in seeds, and then that biomass explodes from those seeds, and I'll bring in four or five 40 pound bags of soft rock minerals, minerals, and that'll treat two to four acres or more. And so we're talking about sulfur, <coughs> potassium, magnesium, so, and uh, phosphorus and calcium. So that's, they make sulfur in pelletized form. So pelletized sulfur, green sand has magnesium and potassium in it, and then soft rock phosphate is its own. Calcium, you can guess, is, comes from ag lime. Now, a lot of people in Central Texas are like, oh, our soils are already too alkaline. We don't need any more calcium. But that calcium is not always available to the soil and the plants. So sulfur can temporarily lower pH, which makes minerals more available. And then adding a little bit of ag lime is an available form of calcium for plants, which they all need. And then if you want to um, add poultry into the mix, like if you've got a pest problem, like three to six chickens is all you need. No roosters in the city, not allowed. 
And we used to raise chickens, but then after about five or ten years, I was like, I really don't eat that many eggs. And then it became the egg carton crisis. Like, I'm like, you got to give me that carton back. I'm giving away all the eggs, but I need those cartons back, you know. And, but poultry is a lot of fun. And then uh, worm composting, which you can do in bins. But it's the same with food scraps. It's like you get fire ants in there. You get raccoons and possums. Every, you know, when we did vermiculture at Fossil Rim Wildlife Center, we had a table with steel legs, and we put the legs in cans of motor oil because the fire ants were just invading the compost bins. Mm -hmm. And then at night, it was the raccoons. And better just to have the, the grass clippings and the composted leaves against the back. Let the animals do what they want with that. And so, you know, we talked about design systems, sustainable design systems. A sustainable system is a system that pays for itself over time. So the longer that system exists, the more payback you get. And the, the more likely it is to be considered a sustainable system. Now, a regenerative system gives back more over its lifetime than it took to create it. And everybody's like, well, Kirby, why don't you just talk about regenerative systems? I'm like, I'd be happy for a sustainable system. We'd be doing good to get there, and then we'll talk about regenerative. Holistic management, agrarian platform. We talked about the broader ecosystem, Del Winters book, The Explorers Texas, and how we are starting a complete deficit of topsoil, biomass, plants, and animals, and how we have to step up our game and plug the holes in our leaky ecosystems. And we have a lot of advantages in the urban environment. There is a great deal of tree cover. You don't have to focus on fencing as much because most people have fences in their backyards. Uh, in the country, if you don't have a fence, forget it. You really can't garden unless you're doing large scale tractor farming because the raccoons and the squirrels will get your fruit and uh, you name it. The rabbits will get everything else and the armadillos will tear it all up. So you basically have to put a armadillo and deer proof fence around and rabbit proof and then be ready with a 22 rifle for the squirrels and all the other things that come in to get your fruit. So you always have to plant or slingshot. Or so you have to plant enough for the local wildlife. And then we talked a little bit about carbon gardening and specific permaculture techniques. Now let's go outside and take a look at this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, pretty rough. Hey, my own really. Um, all right. Um, the thing you just said um, is the big point. Um, you're in a deficit. This yeah. kind of is the real story that like this carbon gardening class is about. And our, our sub theme or our little theme for this this month is make the future richer. So we're talking about richer in terms of ecological richness. So Kirby's giving you this big, you know, understanding of like approaching your ecological projects with a lot of different factors. And to me, this is the way to step forward because so much of our solutions right now, we're trying to pull out one single like silver bullet, one single thread. This is the way it'll all fix everything. Permaculture is about how it's really about integrating everything. Ecology is, is that. Ecology is reality. Everything really is integrated. So now we're going to go outside, and Kirby's going to make as many scathing comments about what we're doing wrong here. And I'm going to, I'm going to make a list, because in two weeks, we're going to come back and do some of the stuff that I know there's at least one thing we have to do. But it's not like hard work. It's, you know, it's going to be fun. It's going to be cold in a couple weeks, too. But we're going to do some of Kirby's work in two weeks, and then two weeks after that, we have another indoor event, and that is the one called Sacred Grounds I mentioned. At the beginning, it's for everybody, and it's National Wildlife Federation talking about how to think of your landscape, your, your campus as a wildlife preserve or a place to bring in for life productivity. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, let's go outside. Quick break.